Hello, my name is Helen Partridge and I'm Professor and Pro Vice Chancellor of Scholarly Information and Learning Services here at the University of Southern Queensland. And it is my great honour to be introducing Dr Matt Finch for today's salon. But first, I'd like to acknowledge country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the University of Southern Queensland recognises that it is situated on country for which the Jarawa and Gayabal people have been custodians for many centuries and which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. So some housekeeping rules and bits and pieces before we jump in. Uh, so mobile phones on silent, please. Um, we have the restroom for those physically with me here in Toowoomba in the foyer. Um, if you wanted to ask some questions, and indeed we encourage you to ask questions or make observations at the end of um, Matt's presentation, uh, you can email them to usqsalon at usq.edu.au or feel free to use our Twitter hashtag, which is usqsalon. A big welcome to those who are physically removed from Toowoomba at the moment, wherever you may be, and joining us online. Um, once again, remember, we do have the email address and the um, Twitter hashtag that you can use to participate in today's um, seminar. So I get the pleasure of introducing uh, a little bit about our guest speaker today, Dr Matt Finch. So I'm going to, because it's, he's quite impressive, actually read some notes. So bear with me. Matt Finch writes and creates immersive play activities for all ages. Live action scenarios incorporating theatre, games and storytelling. He is the 2016 Creative in Residence at the State Library of Queensland here in Australia, a project worker at the British Library Labs and the author of the newsletter Curious, Mysterious, Marvelous, Marvelous Electrical. His work includes writing for print and online media around the world, creating web content for English public services, plus community art workshops and an award-winning researcher in residence role for the University of London. He was a consultant to the Australian Library team which won the National Best Thomas Award for Youth Services in 2014. In 2010, Matt spoke at the British House of Commons for volunteer reading help, now Beanstalk, an English literacy support charity. In 2012, he spoke in Australia's Parliament House at the inaugural meeting of the Australian Early Literacy Parliamentary Friendship Group. In 2014, he was keynote speaker at the Biennial Australian Culture Sector Conference, VALA. Matt also holds a PhD in Modern Intellectual History from the University of London. His writing credits cover a range of print and online media in the US, UK and beyond. So I think we're in for a bit of a treat today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Matt. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. And I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we find ourselves and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, that's particularly important for me as an English visitor to Australia to say that uh, more than just out of politeness as well. Um, I think it is vital that we remember the custodians of the land and the history of the place where we find ourselves. And I will be talking about that a little bit later today. Um, yeah, so making engagement count. I'm just going to put him up there for now. We're going to come back to this chap. But really, it's about listening. You can be as fancy as you want to be, and you have accomplished this, that, and the other. Really, it's about how we listen to communities and how we listen to our partners within our organisations and external to our organisations. And something that I hope we'll come back to, if I just ask you now to just spend 20 seconds thinking about someone you think you don't listen to enough, um, it's not like we handed out a piece of paper or pens or something like that, but if you're anything like me, you have a wallet or a purse which is full of receipts and business cards and things you probably shouldn't have there, and you might have a pen on you, or you have a mobile phone, which we've, of course, set to silent. But if you take a few seconds and think about someone, whether it's at work or at home or in any part of your life that you probably don't listen to enough, now would be the time to write their name down. So I'll just give you a moment to do that. And see people having a think. Okay, so when you get a chance, we'll probably come back to that later on in this session. Um, I won't actually start with this chap. Um, I'll start here. So 
you know, the name of this presentation is Community Engagement, you know, our powers combined, and that's a wonderful thing. And I could give you a super conventional presentation about community engagement. And you know how this works, that somebody gets very enthusiastic and they charm you and they give you examples of fancy things they did and you go, wow, that's amazing, maybe we could do that one day. And then just to show you that they're human and fallible, they may be put in one or two times that things didn't go so well. And you go, oh, so they're real and they've got their feet on the ground and they give you this incredibly enthusiastic, charming presentation, and you're like, oh, that was fancy. And then you go and you have lunch, and you're like, mm, lunch is really nice. And then you go back to your desk, and you're like, yeah, maybe we'll do some of those things. And then a week goes by, and a month goes by, and you know, that fancy presentation doesn't always change into something that makes a lasting change. And if I was going to give that generic community engagement presentation and share those fancy things, I'd start here, and I'd say, three years ago and then two years ago on the streets of a rural New South Wales town, we had kids fighting zombies on the streets of that town in agricultural showgrounds. It was run through the library in a town where the library only opened one day a week where it was run by a farmer's wife part time. And the way we did it is we got the school involved and the community involved and we got the firefighters in and the police in and students from Charles Sturt University were the lead zombies. And we went to all these organizations and we said, do you have community engagement obligations? And they said, yes. So they said, so come and join in a battle on the streets of your town. Let's do something you can't just do through a screen. You can't just do through a book. And because country kids are resourceful and responsible, it will actually be more alive and more special and more challenging than some fancy event taking place in the urban city with all the glamour and special effects. And I would talk about that, but to me, that is something from two years ago, from three years ago. Maybe I would say, you know, this kind of play, this kind of action where it's about experience and adventure and taking part in a big story, it's not just for children and young people. In this day and age where we're so immersed in interactive media and performance and all kinds of aspects of cultural life, I could talk about the burlesque festival that we ran in New Zealand on the eve of the marriage equality bill coming into, uh, coming into effect. So in Auckland, we ran an event which was to celebrate, challenge and question sex and sexuality on the page, stage and screen. And we had movie screenings and we had speakers, academic speakers and panel discussions and we put on a cabaret night. And if I was giving that conventional community engagement presentation, I'd say this kind of immersive stuff it's not just for under 18s. And then I would say, what we're really doing is making different worlds touch, or sometimes just acknowledging that different worlds touch already. This is one of my favorite images from anything I've ever done. It's in a comic book store in Auckland, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for free comic book day. So this was part of community engagement by Auckland Council, running activities inside the comic stores when the comic store owners are giving away free comics and trying to get more trade. And you've got a Maori man giving a hongi, a traditional greeting, to a member of the Rebel Alliance from Star Wars. And it's First Nations culture having a moment of direct contact with the biggest blockbuster pop culture on the planet. Making those worlds touch, dream and reality, history, indigeneity, the most complex political issues and the most playful mainstream pop culture. And I'd go even further. If I was just giving the bog standard community engagement talk, I'd say if you only do it in the CBD or you only do it in a fancy venue, you're not really even doing half of it because actually no one chooses where they're born or who they're born to. And that's why we have schools for all communities. Nobody chooses when they get sick or when they get injured, which is why we try and have healthcare for all communities. And the same is true for access to culture and letting people tell their own stories. So this image, this is Kilbarrack in Dublin, uh, which is the basis for Barrytown in Roddy Doyle's books. If you know his books or movies like The Commitments, which was also a big musical, that's based on this suburb in Dublin. I went there in October. My girlfriend, who's much cooler than me, drank lots of Guinness, ran the Dublin Marathon, and went to the distilleries and breweries. I got on the Dart train, went out to suburban Dublin, and walked in these very ordinary suburban streets because it was where one of my heroes had told his stories. And Roddy Doyle wanted to write the great Irish novel. He was a school teacher, and he was really struggling with it. And then he realized, and he said, every possible tragedy, comedy, adventure, drama, social realism, magic, I could actually tell it 
on the streets that were around me. And so when we talk about this kind of community engagement and giving people access to culture and making their own stories, it's got to be for the Kill Barracks of this world, as well as for these gorgeous city centre venues that we have. So that would be what I'd do if I was just giving the conventional talk and I could be so enthusiastic and I could give you videos of zombies and you'd go woo and maybe you'd make a zombie battle or maybe you wouldn't. But I don't think that's what these kind of activities are about. It's about us having a conversation, not someone broadcasting from a podium. And so what I can talk to you about is how I try and create new things and how we try and approach the challenges we find. And what that is really about is just listening. And so I'm going to start with this chap. This was the, the guy that I did my PhD about. He's a Hamburg art historian called Abby Warburg from the 19th century. And he's a really interesting guy. He was the eldest son of a massive banking family, insanely wealthy. And he was supposed to take over the bank, but he wanted to be an art historian. And the legend goes in the family, he went to the next eldest son, Max, and he said, you can run the bank, but I want to be an art historian. And Max says, okay, what's the catch? And Abby goes, you've got to buy me any book I ask for, ever. And Max is like, okay, we're a really wealthy bank, we'll be fine. Abby Warburg bought 11,000 books. <laughs> And until he became a professor with a university institute to house them in, he had them in his home. And if you've ever felt embarrassed about having some reading matter by the toilet, he even had shelves in his bathroom for some of these 11,000 books. And what's really interesting about him is that he was one of the first of that tradition of European art historians to say, my expertise is the Italian Renaissance and the classical tradition of European thought. But actually, I recognise that indigenous cultures are equally rich, equally valid, and equally valuable. Which leads us to this image, which is, let's say now, looking at it with our eyes in 2016, an uncomfortable one, we see this very privileged German man in his cowboy-style get-up, posing for a photograph with a member of the Pueblo people of New Mexico. But this is actually the beginning of him genuinely trying to listen and acknowledge that a violence is being done to the traditional owners of a land by the development of Western culture and industry. And he particularly would write about the story of the lightning serpent, which was a story that the Pueblo people had. And he was looking at that as an understanding of electricity. And he said, isn't it interesting that Uncle Sam is marching through New Mexico, laying down railroads, laying down telegraph poles, installing the power lines, and that is transforming this landscape when there are already stories and ways of understanding the natural world which pre-exist this development that's going on. So this was my guy when I was 27. And for me, it was about Austrians and Germans who went on to run away from the Nazis. This was just burbling in the background of my studies. And at the same time, I was making my money a few different ways, but one of them was by writing travel guides. So this is one that I co-wrote, The Smart Guide to Salzburg in Austria. And these are great, but back at the time, in the, what was this, 2007-ish, the way this worked was they gave you a wadge of cash, sent you to the country, and whatever you didn't spend, that was the money you made. So you were like, how can I get as much as possible for as little as possible? How can I talk my way into, like, I need to see what a four-star hotel is like in Salzburg, so how can I convince them to let me look around and maybe stay? How can I get the most possible out of a limited budget? How can I listen to this community, spot things that other people wouldn't have noticed, and then make sure they're relevant to a mainstream readership back home? People who are like, I just want to visit Salzburg for a weekend trip. So it was actually great education and community engagement, and it was essentially about listening noticing everything you possibly could because you were on the clock and every second you spent noticing was money that wouldn't be in your pocket at the end of the job. So somewhere between those two things, that kind of made me. And that notion of listening also plays into very sophisticated kinds of writing. Um, this is a quote from a short story writer called Lynn Ullman. And she says, I'm not going to throw many quotes at you today, Writing becomes a listening experience, a way of being responsive to what you have written and letting it guide you. Some writers say the characters come to me, or the characters become alive to me at night. Bullshit, says Lynn Ullman. I don't believe that my characters are alive, but the process requires a form of artistic listening, of understanding the consequences of the decisions you've made. 
And again, that's very much like all of us working within institutional constraints to connect with a community, to listen and respond to their needs and to the needs and the desires of our colleagues. It very much begins with an awareness of capacity and ambition and listening. And it doesn't just happen with PhD students and people doing fancy community outreach and travel guides and story writers and all these privileged, qualified people. A few weeks ago, I was out on the Darling Downs with a farmer called Nick Clapham, who farms cotton way out west towards Pampas. And I got to sit in the cockpit of this uh, John Deere crop header for about 12 hours. <laughs> while he did a day's work until the sun had gone down and beyond. And it blew my mind, because we often think of regional Australia as being not very high tech, and we talk about has broadband got here yet, and what are the problems with Telstra, and do we have good digital access? These things drive themselves. The fanciest, latest ones use GPS, it's accurate to within 20 millimetres, they can use them to set the seeds in the garden. Even this one, 15, 16 years old, it can scan the row of cotton, make sure it stays on track. It knows before it starts how many bales you're gonna make. It tells you how dense the cotton is, so therefore it knows how much money you're gonna make when you sell the cotton to the cotton gin. It does everything for you, and the reason the driver is in there at all is to make sure it turns around properly at the end of a row of cotton, to make sure it doesn't run into a power line. Oh, I've gone one too many. And because when the heads get jammed with a stalk, the best way to clear them is still to disconnect the drive and give it a good hefty kick. <laughs> Which leads to this amazing pictogram. <laughs> that must be the best job to be at John Deere as the visual designer coming up with the warning stick men. This isn't even the best one. There's one about not standing on top of a crop header where it looks like they're doing a jazz dance. I will save that for you to find online. But the reality is in a crop header, the driver, he or she, is serving the machine. They are listening and responding to the constraints that the machine imposes on them. It's doing most of the work and the decision making, and they are tending to it. And talk about listening. For Nick, this crop header was new, so he hadn't got used to it yet. But he said with the old one, he knew it so well that he could hear and feel as the drive shifted. If there was a problem, he would shut the crop header down before the alarms went off because he knew that machine so well and listened to it so carefully that he was aware of its foibles and was aware when it was in trouble. And you might worry that this is some kind of 1984 type future where the machines are doing all the work and the humans are kind of these mindless beasts just clearing out the crop header with their feet. I mean, kicking the head of it. They haven't got anything better than that yet. But actually there is still all this innovation and creativity and practicality in the machine and finding solutions that aren't in the manual, aren't in the rule book, which is the same thing that I do for organizations. So my favorite example was when Nick was servicing the crop header. He doesn't do all five heads at once because it would take too long, so he does them on a rotor. Every now and then he stops and he cleans the head and services it. And the way he keeps track of what happened in the service and which head he's done is he writes it on the window of the cockpit with a Sharpie. So he's in a machine with two computers, five screens, scans the field before it bails it, but he's still taking out a marker pen and squiggling on the, grass, on the glass to keep track of the maintenance record. He's got a smartphone in his pocket, he could just do it on that. But he chooses to do it this way because it suits him and he rubs it off when he goes on to service the next head. And it's not just practical things. He would talk to me about the beauty of the birds of prey circling overhead in the field, seeing the small animals like amassing in the crop, and he'd know they were about to swoop down for something, and he'd see that beauty. Or he'd talk about when they're not planting cotton, they plant sorghum, and the red of the sorghum, he'd say how gorgeous it was, and it was one of his favourite times of years. So we're not talking about people being reduced by this, because there's still a chance to appreciate the beauty of the landscape, and there's still a chance to find your own practical solutions to the problems that you face. But he's basically listening to and responding to this machine as it services the landscape. And now we come to this guy. This is a completely different way of crawling across the landscape. Um, this is a chap called Julian Cope, who was a pop star in the 1980s in England, did fairly well for himself, but 
He lived quite a colourful life. He took some quite colourful substances and he has evolved into becoming a great British eccentric, you would probably say. Uh, he still has a career as a musician and a writer and a performer. And occasionally he does things like he turns up with a traffic cone on his head and a high-vis vest at an event. And he says, I'm dressed like this to test if people are really listening. Are they just judging me because I've got a traffic cone on my head or are they listening to what I say? So he's properly on the eccentric end of the spectrum, I would say. And isn't it funny, I work in a library and most of what I do is about events and uh, I'm really in favour of people doing things with digital technology, but I've actually brought in a book. And it's his book. This is Julian Cope's book, The Modern Antiquarian, which is from the late 90s. And as you can see, when an eccentric man is allowed free reign with the production design, you get something that is quite garish and quite spectacular. Uh, I don't know if you can make this out on the camera or in the audience, but even the pages are rainbow coloured along the spine. It is absolutely delicious. Um, and what he did was he toured every single stone circle site in the British Isles, all the prehistoric and paleolithic sites, he went to them. And that book has a guide to them all. There's a map, it tells you how to get there, it tells you what era they're from, it tells you what kind of stone circles they are. And because he's a bit wacky, you know, he writes some poems. When he's moved to write a poem about the stone, he does. And his wife's with him, and if she wants to sit on the stone and he'll take a photo of her on the stone, he does that as well. It's his project and he does what he wants. And at the beginning, he writes two massive essays about British prehistoric Paleolithic culture. So the real traditional culture of the UK before the arrival of the Romans, back when we were putting up stone monuments. And you know, like, when this came out at the end of the 90s, it made a bit of a splash. He's a bit of a character. He's made a fancy looking book, labor of love. Everyone went, this guy's a bit wacky. And the serious archeologists were like, oh, he's bringing us into disrepute. People will read his book, which is full of really shoddy essays. It's not well researched. He's just used the books he had to hand. He doesn't know the latest developments in our profession. Except, one person, I think this is probably the most important academic essay I ever read. It was a review from the time in a journal called Antiquity by an archeologist called Tim Darville. And Tim Darville said of this book, we as archeologists have let ourselves down by not going that final mile. We have not taken our work out into the wider world. We must sit up and take note of the implications of this book and others like it, to listen up and get real in what we present to the wider world. We need to move away from descriptions and stories of who did what, when and where. Instead, we can focus on engagement, relationships, meaning, perspective and understanding. And I love that this one guy, and now he consults to TV shows who work in archeology span in the UK, and that idea of engaging with the public has become more popular. But I love that he could see that the crazy orange book turtle shell crawling guy who loved stone circles enough to visit every single Paleolithic site in the British Isles, that maybe instead of laughing at someone with that degree of passion, you should be listening to them and finding a way to let them listen into your professional conversations as well. And I think it was very brave and very humble of him to say, it's my failing as an expert if you didn't have access to my expertise. And what did we miss by letting someone so charismatic and so driven do this without the benefit of our research? So that was the late 90s. And even now, I get excited at the thought that someone took on that project, they achieved that, and then some expert somewhere was smart enough to see, we're in the same business. It's learning and exploring. All we need to do is team up. And nowadays, those things have become a little bit more substantial, and there are opportunities that are easy to plug into. I'm not going to talk about this very much today, but there is an event called Fun Palaces, which takes place around the world on the first weekend in October every year. And it was one of those ideas that began in the 60s and then has only come to fruition with the rise of modern technology and with the recognition that we need to focus on local communities. The notion of Fun Palaces is that communities around the world get together on the first weekend in October and they offer the people around them, their neighbors, their workmates, their friends, their family, the chance to explore the arts and sciences on their own terms for free. 
So you look at the capacity of what you can offer, you look at what you dream of offering your community, and you look at what the community could do for you. And it could be anything from doing yarn bombing sessions out in a suburb, to the Royal Opera House in London does a fun palace, fancy venues sharing the latest technology, maker spaces opening their doors, but it can also just be about the people from the streets around you setting up something in their cul-de-sac with the people around them. And if you get excited about the idea of what that might involve, I'm not here to sell you on that, but I've put nine words that you can Google, which are hit the library, get a drink, start a riot. And if you Google those, it will lead you to more information about Fun Palace. And the fact that those nine words are the nine words might tell you something about the attitude as well. They actually come from the original 1960s mission statement. So people were already thinking in terms of cultural engagement that was riotous and challenging and adventurous. And now we say things like disruption, like it's a fancy techno term. But already, Joan Littlewood, the theatre director behind this concept in the 60s, was saying it should have that sense of disorder and freedom. I'm going to give one example from Fun Palaces, which is something that the State Library of Queensland did last year. This may look fancy or it may look simple depending on your eyes. It's an online comic maker where you drag and drop images into those five boxes and you put a caption. And this was made in four weeks from, from basically at the last minute me going, oh, you could do a comic maker on your website. I was based in London at the time. To the actual Fun Palace weekend in October, Phil Goldberg, who did the code, and Talia Yat, who, who was the graphic designer, in four weeks alongside their day jobs, they made this which was an incredible achievement. And as I say, it's a very simple drag and drop comic maker. And people who are in the world of making comic book apps would probably say, oh, it's a bit primitive. But that's actually not the point. Because just like somebody operating within the constraints of a mechanized crop header, just like a writer who operates within the constraints of the story they're building, people use this simple technology to do wonderful things. So I was worried it would all look a bit childish, and Fun Palaces are for all ages. Those images are pretty twee. One of the first comics we got was an HP Lovecraft-style story of someone summoning the souls of the dead to take possession of a robot. You can see here, necromantic tomes are being delivered. Are you sure ensouling a robot is a good idea? Souls of the dead take possession of this vessel. And then the robot ends with its thought, I will destroy them all. <laughs> but we were so pleased to see that it wasn't just going to be cuddly, lovely, bunting, heartwarming stuff. Somebody went, I can take that and I can make a horror story in five panels. <laughs> and, you know, it's not blood and gore. It's not disturbing. It's just, I can hear you laughing now. <laughs> it's just all a bit random. And people could be very sophisticated as well. They made a non-narrative comic. So simple. Rather than having a comic with a beginning, middle, and end, with characters undergoing a journey, this is like a camera move. This is us moving across the foliage, and then there's a very understated punchline. It's a big forest. That's actually an incredibly formally innovative way of using this simple tool. To stop thinking in terms of cause and effect and story was absolutely incredible, and it wasn't something we planned for at all. And then people did things that they might not look so spectacular, but are equally inventive. Like, obviously, someone here, I'm guessing a child, was frustrated by the drag and drop images, that there weren't enough of them. But then they realized that you could type emoji into the caption boxes. So here you've got people in the fourth panel running for the train. And then you can see them escaping in the distance after a science experiment gone wrong. So they said, I want more images, and they realized that by typing emoji into the caption boxes, they could actually expand the image set. And I tell you, that was something we'd never even conceived of when we planned this. So even with something that's incredibly basic, there's all these opportunities for people to surprise you within those constraints. And we've been doing this forever, because what it really is is just working with materials and listening to the materials that you find. So you think of a sculptor encountering a rock and responding to that one rock that they're never going to have again and putting the chisel to it, and every move is going to change it in a way that's irreversible. And there's that old joke that a sculptor doesn't actually make a thing. They just remove all the bits of the stone that don't belong. And it's like working within the constraints of the comic maker. 
you use the material as you find it. And again, I keep saying it's not just artsy things, it's everyday things. You can talk the same way about a stepladder. So a stepladder is a tool for getting up high. It solves a problem for you. But then people start building kitchens with really high shelves that you need a stepladder for. And suddenly, the stepladder is dictating your behavior in the kitchen, because if you want to use that top shelf, you're going to need that tool. So it's like the material is actually setting the constraints for how you behave. And tools themselves kind of tell us what to do if we only listen to them. And it doesn't even have to be verbal. Uh, I put this up. My girlfriend's in New York. She's coming to Australia in August. And she doesn't know what Vegemite is. So I sent her one of those squeezy tubes, like a toothpaste tube of Vegemite. And she said, thank you. I still don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. And because of the time zone difference, by the time I answered her, like, oh, you know, make some toast. I don't know. Like, you, you can come up with something, bit of smashed avo. Um, she had been experimenting. And she put it on mozzarella cheese, which I haven't seen before, but she said it was perfectly workable. <laughs> and you can see in the lines she's made on these pieces of cheese, that intentionality, that awareness of texture and the material, and that sense of motion. And it's a kind of wordless thinking. You can see there's deliberation in using even the consistency of something as humble as Vegemite, listening to the, what the material can do for you. And I love, I, this is the sort of thing I want to do as an experiment. When I say materials tell you what to do, set a table for two, put a really long handle on the cutlery, and you'll very quickly realize that you're going to have to feed the other person. This is by an Austrian artist called uh, Richard Jochum. And the thing is, not only are you going to have to feed the other person, but you're going to have to be really careful. Because <laughs> that, that could go painfully wrong or messily wrong. But the chances are it will go wrong unless you do it with a great deal of care. So simply, a fork or a spoon with a long handle is sending you a message not only about how you eat the dinner, but the fact that you have to actually treat the other person with tenderness and care. It affects the way you manage that relationship because the very nature of the materials are you're going to cause someone at the very least a dinged tooth or soup down their shirt if you're not very, very mindful. And maybe all these machines are a way of extending our care and affection and love. And I was thinking a lot about smartphones. And so many of us now have used Skype and FaceTime to communicate. And have you ever caught yourself, like with a family member or a loved one, blowing a kiss at a camera, which then becomes a signal, bounces off satellites, goes on a screen on a device somewhere else around the world, and they receive your little gesture of love, having been converted into radio waves, bounced back, converted into light waves. Have you ever caught a yawn from someone you were Skyping with? How does that even work? They can be on the opposite side of the planet, and a yawn can be contagious. And we live in a day and age where things like this can happen, where you fall asleep during a Skype call and someone can screen grab you and post it on social media. <laughs> My finest hour, clearly. <laughs> I particularly like that comment on the bottom, which I hadn't seen before, from my friend Barney, who snapped my princess. He's going, and I thought I was sleeping beauty. <laughs> if you saw his beardy immensity, he is, he is if anything, even beardy than me. Um, but this is what it is. It's a machine for augmenting those relationships of care and respect and acknowledgement of one another, because it's a communications device. My friend Anne. She has a very strong American accent. She lives in Brisbane. She has an Australian iPhone with Australian Siri. And Australian Siri can't make head or tail of her accent. And when she says due dates, like deadlines, Siri thinks she's saying doomgate. <laughs> and Anne and her husband liked this so much, it became a family joke. So now when a deadline's coming up, they go, oh, I've got a doomgate coming. <laughs> like, I've got a serious doomgate at the end of July. And it's perfect. But this isn't one of those jokes that's programmed into Siri. Like when you say, oh, Siri, where are you from? And Siri's like, oh, I live in the cloud, or whatever they've come up with over at Apple headquarters. 
Siri made a joke, which has become part of the stories and phrases they use in that family, because Siri misheard Anne. No one could have predicted that someone with a strong American accent was going to speak into an Aussie iPhone and create this, but it's actually become part of their family's stories and relationships. And that's a really lighthearted example, but it also gets really serious. There's a professor in Wales called Harold Thimbleby who works on the problem of people dying due to miscalculated drug dosages. And he says that's not because medics, doctors or nurses have poor math skills. It's not because they're incompetent or unprofessional. It's because especially um, the electric IV pumps are incredibly complicated to use. They have really fussy operating procedures and not very many buttons. And they don't match up with what a calculator does. So you get into situations like this, where a very simple drug calculation, although it doesn't look like it, how many milliliters an hour should an infusion pump be set to in order to give a patient 5,250 milligrams of fluoracil over four days at a concentration of 45.57 milligrams a milliliter? The simplest correct calculation using a basic calculator involves about two dozen button presses. So never mind your math skills, you've got to be careful to press all the operators in the right order. And then the pump itself might have completely different procedures for which buttons you press. So that magic device that is trying to solve these problems and be used in different ways, Professor Thimbleby is working on a smartphone app where it does the calculation for you and then you put the make of pump into the app as well and it says, did you press these buttons in this order? And it offers that double check. But again, it's the material dictating how we behave. It's the operating system of these calculators determining how we operate. And it's a question of life and death. Let's just have a nice, friendly face. That was a lot of tech and a lot of numbers. Oh, it's all smiley. It's all good. This is a chap called Sean Justice in the States. He was at Columbia University and now teaches in Texas. He's got a very memorable name and it's only two words and he's a person worth googling if you're interested in this way of thinking with materials. His work is what led me down this route of exploring digital technology in these terms. He's interested in the ways things like art making and digital media intersect and he operates under a banner of something called material inquiry. So the idea is leading with materials. It's not the person first, but the items that they're using and how we follow on from that. So I thought we'd have a little moment. We'd admire Sean in all his happiness. And it would just be a chance for those of you who think, yeah, he's an interesting guy to remember that name. Sean Justice is lovely. And then we go back to healthcare. Because healthcare fascinates me because it's the pointy end of all this stuff. And when we talk about listening and community engagement, you know, that's where we're trying to save people's lives. And that's where we're trying to give people the best possible livable life. And yet, so often, doctors are concerned with fixing the next thing that's wrong with a body. This book, How We Die, won the National Book Award in America in 1994. So it was a big deal at the time. And this guy, Sherwin Newland, he wrote about the most common causes of death in the US. And the argument he was making, especially with death at the end of life, is were doctors paying attention to the quality of life and the quality of death of an individual patient? Or were they just saying, let's fix the next thing that's gone wrong with this person to keep them alive until something else goes wrong? And it's entirely that mechanistic, solving the problem mindset without thinking about listening to the whole person and their experience and behavior. And I actually read this book um, as a friend of mine was dying and it was off his own shelves. So it all was very uh, real to me at the time that treatments and interventions are not the full story of how your life comes to an end. And yet there's hope on both sides of it and involving the self-same technology. Um, Indigenous Health May Day has just passed in last month in 2016. So this was a social media call out for people to get involved in closing the gap of health inequality between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other populations in Australia. And this was a way of broadening that conversation beyond the professionals and beyond the indigenous communities who were concerned about this to make sure everyone was aware that there was a crisis and there was an inequality and get talking about it. But more importantly than that, 
Some of the people behind this included Bronwyn Carlson at the University of Wollongong, who is an expert on indigenous use of social media, an indigenous academic herself. And her field of expertise includes looking at how indigenous communities use social media to support one another on mental health issues. So it's a way of checking in with people who might be in trouble, even people who are on the brink of really serious acts like suicide. Things like Facebook were the means chosen by communities to intervene and monitor and carry out that business of care between communities before official institutions got involved. So that same piece of kit we keep coming back to, that smartphone understood as an extension of love and duty and responsibility, um, plays absolutely into these issues of healthcare. And now we move on to what I think I started to try and nod to when I, I made my acknowledgement of country at the start of this talk, which is also the question of the fact that we're talking in Australia. And when we talk about community engagement, and when we talk about listening to communities, there is a specific history in this country. And what we do is not just about importing POMs or importing Americans or people from any country with a model. It is also about acknowledging the particular history of this land. There is an exhibition currently on in Brisbane called Frontier Imaginaries, which is art by indigenous artists and also by people who are advocates for indigenous communities. Among them are an anthropologist called Beth Povinelli from New York. And she writes about Australia being a kind of front line in this crisis of how the Western world interacts with objects and the physical world and how we listen to objects and materials. So what she says is that traditionally, the West has said, some things are alive, some things aren't alive, and we can do what we want with the things that aren't alive. So what we do to a rock, we don't have to feel too morally responsible for because it's an inanimate object. So we don't have to pay it the same respect and care. And she talks about that worldview coming to Australia. And she talks about Australia's deep involvement with the resource industry, which is of course made out of treating the land as a resource or an object to be exploited. And then she contrasts that with the many different indigenous communities that predated the English coming to Australia and the way that many indigenous worldviews involve respecting the land as something which has identity and agency and power in its own right. And she says, if we're entering a moment where because digital objects speak back to us, because climate change tells us that you can't just do what you want with the inanimate world, that worldview has to have a reconciliation with other ways of understanding inanimate objects. And she points to Australia as being a front line where we are practically engaging with communities that see the world differently. And that actually, when we do practical community engagement, we are part of that big cosmic philosophical discussion. One of the exhibits in Frontier Imaginaries, which is brilliant, is by the artist Megan Cope, who's from Stradbrook Island and now works in Melbourne. And what she did was recreated middens using recycled materials within the art gallery. Now, because I'd mostly worked inland in central West Australia, I'd never come across a midden before, so I didn't know that coastal indigenous people had created these, effectively a form of Aboriginal architecture where the legacy of meeting places along the coast meant that things like oyster shells piled up and created these material installations. And that then colonists and subsequent Australian authorities had treated these as things to be moved or resourced or repurposed into other things, but not as architecture that had to be respected and protected in its own right. So when we talk about this back and forth between inanimate objects and people and respecting communities and acknowledging the past, someone like Megan taking the middens and putting it back in the heart of a cultural space like the art gallery, reminding us that this history is unavoidable, reminding us that we have to have a reckoning with these material objects, is also part of what we do. That's not big, highfalutin cosmic talk. It's about putting one step, one foot in front of another in terms of how you engage with communities. And the funny thing is, it all comes full circle. So, if you go back to the history of the English word conscious, unbelievably, if you go back, there's an example here from the 17th century, there is a sense, which is now difficult for us to define, 
where inanimate objects are described as being aware of human actions. So there's an example given in this listing from Raymond Williams' Keywords, which is from 1643. But even more interesting, there's a quote from the American poet Emerson visiting Stonehenge, visiting the stone circles of the British Isles. And he says, to these conscious stones, we two pilgrims were alike known and near. So already in the history of English language and English thought, there is a lingering notion that it's okay to listen to objects, whether that is smartphones or the landscape or the history of the ground beneath your feet. And maybe part of this post-colonial dialogue is also reactivating that. I'm almost done, which is good. And I thought I would end with Doctor Who because I like Doctor Who. And I thought I would end with the word listen because that is what we're really trying to do. We've gone all over the place, different activities, different examples, big examples, small everyday things. But for me, it's about the next step is doing something real. And that might be like you can take a route like doing a fun palace in October and exploring what it means to have a conversation with a wider community about your field of expertise. It might be setting yourself an uncomfortable challenge, like off the basis of what I've just been saying. What would happen if next year's USQ Salon only had indigenous speakers? What challenges would that pose? What things would you have to face up to? Choosing which indigenous communities were represented, the difficulties of making those negotiations. Would people accuse you of being tokenistic? What would happen if you confronted those things head on? What would you hear? What would be different? I'm really mindful of my position as a super fortunate, super privileged white guy who gets to stand here at the front and hold forth. That's the truth of it. I get to have a big scruffy beard. I bet if you had a female presenter here, they'd be a lot tidier than me. I'm really quite unkempt. And you understand the language that I'm speaking because 200 years ago, people who came from my country turned up on this country, turned up on this land and decided to claim it for themselves. I was born in 1980. I don't consider myself complicit with that act, but I still benefit from what they did because I can stand here and you go, he speaks our language. We even drive on the same side of the road. The queen of my country is on the other side of your coins. And I'm not saying like that everything has to be overthrown in a single moment but it has to be acknowledged and listened to and questioned. And I think, it's funny, I just wrote this down because I saw Obama's press release about the death of Muhammad Ali. And he chose a great Ali quote to put in that press release because he didn't choose anything cosy or congratulatory. When he quoted Ali's words, he quoted Muhammad Ali saying, I am America, I am the part you won't recognize but get used to me, black, confident, cocky, my name, not yours, my religion, not yours, my goals, my own, get used to me. Just think about that first bit, I am America, I am the part you don't recognise. Just trade out their country's name for your own. What is the part of Australia that you don't recognise? We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. And at the start, I asked you to think of somebody that you don't listen to. I'm going to give you another 20 seconds to think of anyone else you'd want to add to that. Any organisation or community that you don't think you listen to enough at work or at home. Any person around you that you think you maybe could listen to more. So I'm just going to give you like 20 seconds if there's any other names you might like to add to that. And what I'm really hoping, you'll make me so happy if you do this. You've listened to me for so long. I want to go and sit down there. And I want one or two or three or four of you to come up here. And I want you to maybe come and sit on the sofa. And if there's any response you want to make, if you want to talk about either of those names from the start or the end of this session, I would like to listen to you. So if there's anyone who'd be willing to do that, that would be great. 
I know there are two people that I might pick on to get things started because they have really good examples. But I hope someone will join us as well. I'm going to ask Joe and Fiona. I'm going to ask Joe Beasley from Toowoomba Libraries to talk about Ozobots and teens. And Fiona, despite being so shy, to talk about pumps. <laughs> You know more about those than I do. Would you come up for me, please? They're very, very shy, but they are wonderful human beings. And they do a lot more good work than I do. Thank you, Joe. Take a mic with you. Perfect. It's all yours. I know. It's good. <laughs> The story Matt wants me to share is we received a grant from the State Library of Queensland last year and have just rolled it out and we specifically targeted um, teens in rural areas to come and do some workshops with us, some life skills, and we included some coding and robotics and included playing with Ozobots, and, which are these tiny little baby robots. We taught them how to code using um, colours and they could do swirls and go backwards and forwards and zigzag. But we wanted to do, um, I guess, take it a bit further and work out what we could do if we were going to run some programs for kids. So we thought to ask the teens, you know, what, what we could do. And then we started thinking, OK, let's go a step further. Can you tell us your life story? Can you, what can we do with them, you know? And so I asked the teens to tell me their life story. So using this little Ozobot and using the colour codes. So some of the kids wrote their names and got the Ozobot to follow the curves of their names, to do little circles at the ends, to do exclamation marks. Um, some of them uh, did like, you know, patterns of where they were going and stuff. But the probably the most amazing one was this boy teen who wrote jail up one end jail up the other and then just had direct lines and so his Ozobot literally went up and down and ended up in jail and so when I started asking him about it and he said and talking about his life story he was saying that basically his whole life he's been told that that's where he'll end up and so regardless of what what happens to him and those up and downs of the Ozobot that that's where he'll go. And so it was quite an amazing, um, you know, we had these grand ideas of what the outcomes would be for our engagement with these teens, but just sitting there and listening to them interact with these tiny little baby robots was quite a um, humbling experience and just realising that um, technology can work in so many different ways that you don't think about it if you just listen. Is that OK? Yeah. And Fiona, you had a background in healthcare, didn't you? And how was, you, sorry, how was your experience listening to technology? Technology was at times supposed to make your life easier, but that, that example that you gave with the, um, with the pumps is a, an example of us trying to adjust our works and behaviours to fit in with something that was actually created with not that great amount of listening to the people on the ground floor. So I think that listening component um, is very, very important so that we can actually use the technology to, um, to help us rather than it shaping us in ways that may not be quite as effective. Um, and I suppose my role at the moment is um, as part of the First Five Forever program, which is looking at trying to um, reach out beyond the walls of libraries to help engage parents of zero to five year olds and getting them confident in, in being their children's first teacher and looking at things such as baby rhyme times and story times and getting um, parents involved with that early language and pre-literacy stuff with their children. So it is, it's about listening and trying to not look at the, the same old concepts of we offer these sorts of things within the walls of the library but there is a whole community out there that does not access the library or does not access those services. So it's trying to look a bit outside the box and trying to go where the community is. So if it's shopping centres, it's shopping centres. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. They can't wait to get off the stage, can they? <laughs> That's wonderful.
and I might leave it to you to close. Thank you. Thank you. Last time I let you, but I did. Wow. That was absolutely amazing. I think we've been really privileged to have Matt join us today. So um, I'm going to invite everyone online as well to put your hands together to say thank you to Matt. <laughs> a small token just to say thank you we really do appreciate you coming here and just providing us with some inspiration and some challenging ideas and making us think a little bit more carefully about do we listen and what do we need to do in terms of um, next steps thank you Helen. It's been to, a to really pleasure. engage with our communities thank you thank you and I think if there's a slide for the next event coming along I don't have my clicker with me my apologies <laughs> we have Voila. actually another I think going to be amazing speaker join us next month and that's Associate Professor Steve Wheeler. Um, so some of you might know him from his blog, Learning With Ease. Um, he does a lot of work with technology supported learning and teaching. Um, so I think we're gonna be truly, truly blessed there with that presentation for next month's salon. So I hope you'll be able to join us, whether online um, or physically here at Toowoomba. And on that note, I think I'm gonna say thank you to everyone else online. Thank you to those joining us here in Toowoomba and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>